Recently, I was contemplating what makes like an apartment building stable? What makes it a stable asset? And there's a few factors that go into what makes something stable. I have sort of a view of what apartments are like in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has some of the most stringent rent controls. There's new and improved rent controls all the time. So having a stable apartment in Los Angeles might very well look different, you know, than a stable apartment in like Tucson, Arizona but there's still the same kind of elements to what makes an apartment stable. And I thought I would do kind of a video on that because these are the five things that one of them might be like your Achilles heel. One of them might be like, you've got four, but the like one, you're like, oof, I gotta focus on that one. I'm doing this video. <laughs> I filmed two videos already. Okay, I'm like really trying. I did this video because there are five things, if you have an apartment building and you're feeling like you're struggling with, one of these things has got to be the thing that, that might you might want to focus on and really hone in on. And focusing on that might be able to help you, you know, potentially work towards stability. The first one is occupancy rates. Occupancy rates is like one of the main benchmarks of stability. If you have high occupancy or low vacancy is another way of saying it, then that demonstrates that your you know, building is in demand or housing in the area is in demand and that your apartment is an attractive, reliable investment. Occupied units tend to be in highly desirable areas. So major metropolitan areas tend to have high occupancy rates or low vacancy rates. But even within Los Angeles, I have seen you know, corrections. Like I've seen in South LA, there's been higher vacancies. And I think people during the pandemic, a lot of them I think moved out of, out, of, out of LA or even out of the state. Or a lot of tenants didn't pay rent and then they up and left their apartment and located elsewhere. So there has been some sort of correction in occupancy rates. But occupancy rates, that's like the main thing that makes the building stable now obviously having rents that are high good but if you have a lot of vacancies that's going to kill your cash flow having one two long-standing vacancies makes a huge impact on your bottom line if you don't know are you you know you should run your numbers and then you should run your numbers with those vacancies filled at market rent and you'll see the difference you know over a 12-month period if you're to project out it can really hinder your bottom line. So the occupancy, if you have um, too many vacancies, it can really destabilize your building. And next one is a very strong and diverse tenant base. I have at least one video, but I'm sure I have other videos on you know vetting and stressing the importance of vetting tenants. You want to have a diverse kind of group of tenants. So like, let's say you like really niched in having um, a certain type of tenant, and maybe that job went away. Like, you know, for tech industry, sometimes, you know, they focus on having all these, you know, like all the tech employees are gonna come in, but maybe tech has moved out. So then they also move and they go to where the jobs are. So over-focusing on, on one segment could hinder you because that could, they move out and then you have a bunch of vacancies, maybe all at the same time, because it's a trend, right? So you wanna have different professions, you wanna have people with different backgrounds and you wanna have, you know, potentially different economic levels. So when you have a building, depending where it's at, like it could be, you know, in a very specific spot where it only attracts the same kind of tenant. But the more central that your building is to, you know, a major metropolitan hub, like more central your building is, let's say to like downtown, like Los Angeles, like downtown LA, you're going to get diversity. You might get USC students. You might get professionals that work in the high rises. Then you might get people who, um, you know, work within like the restaurants or the retail in that area so you'll get a diverse set of income so you, you want to look at that not only like the students who go to usc but you might also have teachers that are either regular teachers or adjunct professors regular professors or adjunct professors who have housing so that might be kind of in your area so you want to keep you want to have a diverse tenant base so that for the most part once they're well vetted and in they'll probably be there longer and if there's been changes like maybe students they come and go they come, you know, in let's say August and they go in June and you have three months. You, ha you have at least an understanding of that cycle. Other people will probably stay there long term. So having a diverse tenant base, like having a diverse, you know, 
set of stocks that you invest in. It helps with mitigating the first thing we talk about, which is you know the occupancy issue. Another thing which I slightly touched on is location desire and desirability. So simply put, where there's strong economic growth, where there's jobs, there will be tenants. Even further, if you wanna like hone down where there's good schools. I mean, people will move to where there's a good school. They'll find a place, live in an apartment where there's a good school, either a private school or even a really good public school, charter school, um, you know, blue ribbon school, they'll go. Low crime rates, which in Los Angeles, is a handful of places now when there's low crime rates. Historically, people will go live there. And access to amenities. So I've talked about this in other videos, access to major um, metro lines of buses, access to you know shopping hubs, where there's you know close to a Costco, close to a Target, close to you know maybe a hospital, things like that. You know, you'll get people who will want to be there because it's central and localized. So location and desirability also helps having a stable apartment. And sometimes you might have an apartment and maybe it's just like not on the right street or just not in the right area. That might be something that's gonna be harder to fix. But maybe something, or maybe you're just not addressing, like let's say you have vacancies, maybe you're not highlighting these things to people. You know, people might be coming in and moving from out of town and they might not know, yo, I'm next to a Target, I'm next to a Costco, I'm next to, you know, apparently I only shop at, <laughs> at Target and Costco. <laughs> like, whatever. We have a huge hospital by, like, here's these really good schools. You might wanna map that. You know, so if a tenant's moving and they're like, they don't know, are they gonna be from LA? But like, you could be, like, you could be born and raised in Pasadena and like never know anything about Mid City, but maybe you're moving to Mid City. So like you need help with that. So pointing that out can also help, but you know, having multifamily there helps to begin with. Low operating expenses. So a lot of operating expenses are fixed. Your mortgage is pretty much fixed. Your insurance, it's gonna go up every year a little bit, but it's you know, more or less an expected cost. Same thing with property taxes. Management fees are typically a percentage of your gross rent collected. It's usually about between four and 6%. So that's kind of fixed, you can project that. But maintenance is the one that's probably the largest variable. And maintenance is the one that tends to be what destabilizes buildings the most because it's an expense that can get, it can get away from you fast. And the reason being a lot of apartment buildings that people own are older. So they might need a new roof. They might need a new plumbing. They might need a new electrical. Plumbing, electrical, roof, three of the banes of every landlord's existence. If one of those things goes out, it's like more or less chaos to you. So being able to save up or anticipating that or getting ahead of it, if you you know have the budget or the foresight and fixing it will help. Plumbing upgrades, and electrical upgrades are like two really, really important upgrades that if you fix those two, upgrade those two, can um, prolong the life of the building and cut down a lot on those variable expenses. Ha also having strict rules for tenants about plumbing, like no baby wipes, no flushing baby wipes is a huge one. I'd like to talk about this in so many videos. It has triggered me. But having, you know, good rules, like if you want a tenant to not do something, um, they don't know. Like a lot of tenants, they just simply don't know. Not because they're disrespectful, they just like don't know. Like don't flush baby wipes. You know, don't overload a circuit. A lot of other things, you know, good housekeeping, like cleans, you know, clean up. There's a bunch of things. There's usually house rules for it. Like in my lease template that I sell, my lease package is a bunch of house rules that tells tenants what not to do. Sometimes you might wanna put visuals. Like if you have a trash bin, you know, black, green, blue, Green's the new one in LA. What goes in each? And then it helps tenants and then they know. A lot of the times they just don't know. So educating on that can also help cut back on a lot of expenses or just cut back on certain expenses. But those three systems, roof, plumbing, and electrical, are usually when you have issues with tenants, it's usually plumbing related. It's usually the, might be the roof leaking or their uh, breaker keeps tripping. Another thing with, with expenses, um, that's becoming more and more popular is rubs, which is ratioed utility billing. I don't know, S could be system. I really don't know what the S is for. I should know, but I don't. That's where the, you know, you take a utility bill and you ratio it against all, you know, the tenants for things that are like not submeter, like um, electrical and gas tend to be the most things that are submetered, but sometimes water sewer isn't. So those ones, you know, you have the ability to divvy it up against the tenants and go, hey, you're gonna, you know, pay for your portion. 
you're in a rent controlled area, um, you have to kind of, you have to do that at the outset because what your lease is is what your lease is. So if you pay for water as a landlord, water sewer, you're gonna pay for water and sewer like ongoing. So just make sure you keep that in mind. But if you have a new lease, you have a vacancy, you might want to look into a looking up um, utilities, you know, sub meter and utilities are, are divvying the utilities amongst tenants so that they pay for their water usage. Water as a utility tends to be the one that drives most landlords crazy because it's one you like really, especially in LA, I don't know about other places, but in LA, a lot of landlords pay for water and that tends to be like a really crazy expense. And it's very hard to pinpoint, especially if you have a building with a lot of units, it's really hard to figure out if it's not immediately obvious, like something's leaking or the landscaping, it's hard to figure out if someone's just running water to run it, someone's using too much water, um, someone has too many people living in a unit. It's like hard to figure that out. So having, you know, passing on water to the tenants is a way that you can lower that cost. And it also makes tenants more responsible because they're paying for that utility. Something, when you don't pay for something, you tend to not think about it or not care about it. That's true of anybody across the board. Like if it's not your expense, you might not be considered about it. It's like, that's someone else's problem. So that's when I see like expenses and I'm looking at them and I'm kind of itemizing what's hindering someone, water tends to be a huge one. Utilities tend to be a huge one. So just looking at your expenses and seeing what can be done to mitigate them, seeing what's like consistently weird, like what is the most common work order I'm getting? Maybe that's a central issue that I gotta fix. Like maybe there's something wrong with the plumbing. Maybe, maybe we gotta do a repipe, something like that. Or maybe we need the main line flushed. Some, you know, maybe it's something that's not as crazy as a whole building repipe, but something that could be done. Maybe get the plumber out there and have a look at it and do some suggestions. Maybe you wanna put, you know, more uh, energy efficient water features not water features, but like, um, you know, like faucets, shower heads, fixtures, more water um, efficient fixtures. And the last one, um, which kind of goes to the operating expenses and what I just talked about, but just more in depth, is regular maintenance and upgrades. When If you have an apartment building and it's a little bit larger, your resident manager can help. You could give your resident manager kind of a checklist and they could go around and look, you know, for things like tripping and like tripping hazards. Finding a tripping hazard and addressing it is somewhat probably a manageable thing that can be done. Maybe even a handyman can do, but you know, it'll like save you a lot of headaches of like tenants tripping and complaining and potentially getting, you know, personal injury suits for that. So that's in one. The overall attractiveness of your property, having really nice landscape um, helps. I know in Los Angeles, like LA city, the California state has a turf replacement rebate that's administered through local municipalities. So like LADWP being the one that has the, the water and power for the city of Los Angeles, they have a rebate. So if you were to go and replace all of your grass with California native drought tolerant landscaping, it not only saves you money, but it promotes, you know, what the state is working towards, which is, you know, cutting back on water and being um, mindful of water usage because we do have droughts in California. You know, we've had a huge one and they pay you. So the rebate pays, I believe, $5 a square foot. So I've done several of those applications and I think I've, you know, for one client, ballpark 80 plus thousand dollars in pre approved applications for LEWP to replace the landscape. So you do have to front the cost of doing it. But there is, you know, a lot of free resources in Los Angeles. There's a lot of resources on, you know, drought tolerant landscaping, things like that. And you know, you do get paid to replace the landscaping and you do cut back on your water and quite frankly, your landscaping expense because California native plants tend to require less landscaping needs, saves a lot of water. So that's, you know, things like that you can look at. Like I have it in, you know, the, my lease package that I came up with, but you wanna do like routine inspections of, of not only just the exterior of the property, which I have a video on that, um, I'll link it, you know, the five vital things you should check on your property, but also just going into the units and making sure that, you know, the tenants are maintaining the unit as they should be. They're engaging in good um, housekeeping and, but that there's not any blatantly, obviously things going wrong. Like there's not leaking faucets, leaking sinks, running toilets, 
things like that. So you want to inspect the units, ideally, you know, at minimum twice a year. Quarterly, you want to do that. Typically, if you're going to do it quarterly, you might want to have like a provision or lease, which is, you know, the one that I mentioned, my lease package has quarterly reserved in it. But at minimum, every six months, you're going to want to go in and, and check the units and make sure. And a good way of indicating if things are going wrong, which I kind of talked about in point four, is if your water bill is high. If your water bill all of a sudden like shoots through the roof, you might know like there's something wrong. Like there's a plumbing thing that has to be looked into. But just, you know, not only just the aesthetic appeal, like if your your apartment looks nice, um, if you have a nice coating of paint, I understand paint's expensive. Um, maybe in lieu of that, you, you clean the building, you do maybe a power wash on the building, you power wash the the walkways that's always very nice making sure there's no trash in your landscaping also helps if you're a resident manager they can help with that having nice landscaping that makes the building more attractive which goes towards you know um, the desirability of the building which is point three but just trying to catch things before they become a problem another um, thing i'm going to add to this part is maybe getting a security camera system so that you, if someone, let's say, is abusing the trash, you can catch that and you can write them up. Also, if you have a resident manager, give them access to the security camera system and they can pull the footage and they can go, hey, you know, because they're, you're, they're your eyes and ears. So they'll see and they go, hey, this was an issue, pointing it out to you. And that can help kind of curb that and set the tone. But those are the five factors. If one of those things sounds like, ah, yes, you, that's something you wanna hone in on and but having all five of those like perfectly in a row, you have an extremely stable apartment. But any one of those things might be your weakest link and might be destabilizing it or might be affecting your bottom line. So you wanna look at it. And some things you, like, you can't change where the apartment's at. Like the, the building is where it's at. But maybe you can work on your curb appeal. And then when you're marketing vacancies, you know, I have a video also on you know things to consider if you're rehabbing a vacant unit. So you might wanna check that video out. But when you go to list it, you might wanna highlight all of the good things as much as you can about the building's location. So create the desirability of it. If it doesn't seem blatantly obvious to you that's desirable, it might be to someone else You know that maybe it's affordable for them and it's near a lot of things that they like. So if you've ever had like a real estate agent do like a broker's opinion of value, they have like, typically I've seen it where there's like a map and they point out all of the things. Like here's the Target, here's the Costco, here's SoFi Stadium, here's this, here's that. You know, you could do that, point that out. Like this is where the building's located and here's all the amenities around it. You know, they're not far away. And that what you know, that can help with point one, occupancy. So hopefully you found this video helpful. I also do a weekly newsletter. Click the link below and sign up for that. I send it every Sunday. It tends to have very helpful information for landlords, you know, relevant news. And if this was also very helpful for you. I wouldn't mind if you liked and subscribed. Other than that, thank you and I will see you in the next one.